My name's Matt Duff. I'm a private investigator, and I've been working on a capital murder case that's about to come to a head. This is an interview with the man convicted of the murders. You were convicted, of course, of killing your cousin, James Mosqueda, and his fiance, Amy Kitchen. Uh, did you kill them? I did not. Um, I know that at first glance, people, they think the worst, and if they will just um, you know, look at the facts, look at the case that not only that was presented you know, to the jury and to what was withheld from my defense, they'll clearly see that I'm an innocent man and I, I do not belong here. That was Ivan Cantu, and Ivan is scheduled to be executed April 26th of this year. Ivan has maintained his innocence since his arrest in 2000, and for a capital murder case with an upcoming execution, there are a lot of unanswered questions and problems with this conviction. But to understand why, you'll need to understand the case and the timeline. Now this case takes place over six days in the year 2000 in Dallas. This is a picture of Ivan in 2000. That picture was taken about a week before the murders. Ivan was at a Halloween ball and the girl with him was his girlfriend at the time. Her name is Amy Betcher. And a few days after the murders, Amy Betcher will come forward and become the state's star witness. At the time, Ivan and Amy were living in this apartment together. They had just gotten that apartment together about two weeks prior to the murders. They had only been dating for about two months before the murders. Now, this is a picture of Ivan's cousin. His name was James Mosqueda, and he's beside his fiance, Amy Kitchen. And yes, both Ivan and James were with a blonde named Amy. Now, this is the house that James and Amy were living in. Their house was about two miles from Ivan and Amy's apartment. At the time, Ivan and James were both 27. And like I said, they're cousins. This is a picture of them growing up together. They're around seven years old in this photo. So those are the four main characters at this point. Ivan and his girlfriend, Amy Betcher, and James and his fiance, Amy Kitchen. The official narrative of the state's case comes from Amy Betcher. So let's go to the night of the murders. Ivan got home at about 10 p.m. that night after working his two jobs. He was working as a loan officer during the day and waiting tables at night. So between 11 p.m. and 11.30 p.m. that night, Ivan calls James. Amy says that he speaks with him briefly, and when he hangs up the phone, he tells her that he's going to go kill James in Amy Kitchen. He left, and he gets back at about 12.18 a.m. Amy said that he's covered in blood, and he's wearing latex surgical gloves. She said that Ivan had James' keys, James' wallet, James and Amy's IDs, and James' Rolex watch. Amy said that he took off his bloody jeans, his bloody socks, and gloves, and put them in the kitchen trash can. She said that Ivan showered and changed clothes. Then they went over to their friend's apartment. His name was Smiley. After Smiley's, Amy said that Ivan took her back to the crime scene. He took her back to James and Amy Kitchen's house, where she saw their dead bodies in the back bedroom. After Ivan essentially gave her this tour of the crime scene, she said that when they left, Ivan got in James' Corvette and drove that back to their apartment. You'll remember their apartment was about two miles from James and Amy's house. And Amy said when they got back to their apartment, Ivan gave her a ring and proposed to her. And in her statements to police, she said this is the same ring that she later found out belonged to Amy Kitchen. Three different police officers took Amy's statement, which explains the different handwriting. After the proposal, they hop back in James' Corvette and they head to a techno club called Club 7. This is a picture of Club 7 from around 2000. But on the way to Club 7, Amy said that Ivan threw out James' Rolex, the one that he had stolen a couple hours prior. She said he threw it out the driver's side window as they were going down the tollway. They were only at Club 7 for a few minutes and then they decided to go to some other house parties nearby. And after this drug-fueled night of partying, they get back to their apartment in the wee hours of the morning. And this is when the story gets even more intriguing. This also happened to be the weekend that Amy wanted to introduce Ivan to her parents for the very first time. And even though she had witnessed everything that she said she did the previous night, the plan was still to introduce Ivan to her parents this Saturday. But her parents lived in Franklin, Arkansas. That was about an eight-hour road trip from Dallas. They got to Arkansas at about 8.30 p.m. that night. And they did tell her parents that they were engaged, they showed off the ring, and they ended up spending three days in Arkansas for this meet the parents long weekend. What's also intriguing is that Amy's stepdad was a former cop, but for these three days in Arkansas, Amy didn't tell her parents anything about Ivan committing these murders. But back to that Saturday that they were traveling to Arkansas, that's also the same day that James and Amy Kitchen's bodies were found. They had been shot to death in their back bedroom. James' body was found laying face up in the bed, and Amy Kitchen's body was face down on the floor beside the bed. 
Amy Kitchen's engagement ring, James Rolex, and James Corvette were reported missing by the families. The next day, through Lojack, Dallas PD had located James Corvette parked outside Ivan's apartment. Two days later, Ivan and Amy were wrapping up their trip in Arkansas. That same day, as they were heading back, the police had gotten a search warrant for their apartment. And in that apartment, in the kitchen trash can, the police found the bloody jeans, the bloody socks, uh, the latex glove, and a blue Solo cup in the trash. Blood on those items will later be matched to the victims. When Ivan and Amy got back to Dallas, they didn't go to their apartment. They went to Ivan's ex-girlfriend's apartment. Her name is Tawny. This is a picture of Ivan and Tawny in the summer of 2000, celebrating Ivan's 27th birthday. Tawny had heard about the murders, and she was worried for Ivan's safety. So Ivan and Amy end up crashing at Tawny's that night. Ivan and Tawny left the apartment in the morning. Ivan was going to meet with the police. He had been in constant communication with the police while in Arkansas, and he told them he would come meet with them and give him an interview when he got back to Dallas. Tawny went to work in the morning, and Amy said she slept most of the day on Tawny's couch. That afternoon, Ivan got arrested for the murders of James and Amy Kitchen. Ivan called Tawny and Amy to let him know that he had been arrested, and Amy ended up getting a flight back to Arkansas that night. When Tawny dropped Amy off at the airport, before Amy got on the plane, she told Tawny, you might want to look around your apartment. Uh, Ivan might have left something. Tawny went back to her apartment, flipped up a couch cushion, and found a gun that turned out to be the murder weapon. On the magazine of the gun, the police found a latent print, and that was matched to Ivan's left thumbprint. After getting back to Arkansas, Amy told her parents that Ivan had killed James and Amy Kitchen, and the following day, she went to the police and gave her statement. And that's the case, the official story in a nutshell, and it does sound about as open and shut as it gets. But here's how quickly it can unravel. When you look at the state's case, basically, you know, you're looking at Amy Betcher's testimony and you're looking at the, the, the physical evidence which the state argued linked him to the murder and corroborated Amy's testimony. If you are willing to acknowledge, first, the probability that Amy lied for whatever reason, and second, the, the possibility that the evidence might have been planted, then there's nothing else. You're not left with anything. When you look more closely and, and you see the, the problems with Amy Betcher's testimony that weren't vetted at trial at all, um, you see the, the evidence that supports an argument that a lot of this evidence found uh, in supposedly, purportedly linking Ivan to, to the offense, the very real possibility that, you know, there was at least an opportunity for other people to have planted that evidence uh, in an attempt to frame Ivan. There was just a lot that the jury didn't hear. Essentially what Ivan's lawyer just said has been Ivan's story for the past 22 years that Amy lied, that she made that story all up about him committing the murders, coming back bloody, and that all the evidence that was found, the jeans, the socks, the Corvette, uh, the gun, that had all been planted. Since 2020, I've been laying out my investigation episodically on a podcast entitled Cousins by Blood. So first, is there evidence that Amy lied? Yes, there is. You'll remember in Amy's statement, Amy stated that Ivan came back bloody with items belonging to James and Amy Kitchen, one of those being James Rolex. And in her statements and on the witness stand at trial, she testified that Ivan threw that Rolex out of James Corvette window as they were going down the tollway. Well, that wasn't just any Rolex James had and Ivan allegedly stole. Uh, that was a family heirloom. It once belonged to James and Ivan's uncle, Uncle Lico. Here he is pictured with his family. Engraved on the back of the Rolex was Lico's name, Love His Wife Carol. Well, early on in my investigation, I discovered that although this Rolex was reported missing by the family, that a few weeks after that report was made, that the family actually found the Rolex. It was actually tucked away in the house. Ivan did not steal that Rolex, but because it was originally reported missing. This looks like the state told her what to say that, you know, they fed her information, information that, that as it turns out, was incorrect and um, told her what to say. I mean, obviously, that Rolex watch, she never saw that Rolex watch. Obviously. 
She never saw Ivan throw it out the car from the tollway. But that's what she testified to. That was demonstrably false. The issue with the Rolex, the issue with the ring, which of course was never, was never found. And let's talk about that ring, because at trial, it was presented that Amy Batcher was wearing Amy Kitchen's ring the night of the murders, and also showed Amy Kitchen's ring off to her parents in Arkansas. But what wasn't explained to the jurors is there was no ring in evidence. Amy's story is that traveling back to Dallas from Arkansas, Ivan took the ring back from her, but at that point, uh, essentially, the ring disappeared. It was never to be seen again. But in Amy's statement, you said that you later found out that it was Amy Kitchen's ring. How did you find out it was Amy Kitchen's ring? Um, when the detectives were in Arkansas, they asked where the ring was. They just said um, her ring was missing. Just like the police telling her the Rolex was missing. And then how did they know that, the, I guess, the ring that Ivan gave you was the engagement ring? Well, I just put it together, like, kind of like two and two or whatever. I just assume that that's what he probably took. There was no photo identification. The police just told her she was wearing Amy Kitchen's ring. Ivan confirmed she was showing off a ring that night, but Ivan said that was not Amy Kitchen's ring because he did not kill Amy Kitchen and take her ring. And he said that Amy already had a cubic zirconia ring that she was showing off, telling people that they were engaged. And not just the night of the murders, other nights as well. Over the course of my investigation, I came across two witnesses who saw Amy showing off a ring prior to the murders. So was Amy Betcher really wearing Amy Kitchen's ring? Well, the only evidence that supports that is Amy Betcher's testimony. And she lied about the Rolex, so why would she be considered credible about the ring? See, most of the evidence Amy said Ivan had that tied him to the crime, she also said that he threw it away in multiple dumpsters or threw it out the car window. For most, there was no hard evidence. It was just her testimony. She also testified that Ivan threw away her boots because they were connected to the crime scene. But here again, like the Rolex, Ivan did not throw them away. They were later recovered from the vehicle they drove to Arkansas, but the jury never heard that. Amy's testimony is riddled with perjury, but the main crux of Amy's story is after when she says Ivan came back committing the murders, that she was scared to death of Ivan for the next few days, but Ivan had taken her hostage. But I tracked down individuals that Ivan and Amy were hanging out with the night of the murders. Remember, they were out uh, party hopping. This is part of my interview with Smiley. See, your place, is the first place that Amy says that her and Ivan went to after he committed the murders. Nah, man, you know, they didn't think, it, you figure a man done killed two people in 30 minutes and they come to your house, you just had her nerves. And you didn't sense any of that? No, not at all, not at all, not at all. And you'll remember Amy's stepdad was a former cop. And Ivan was around him for three full days in Arkansas. So surely if Ivan had committed these horrific murders, uh, he would have gotten some inclination. And yet, Amy's stepdad told me... Actually, like I say, I, he was very calm and cool. He'd crack jokes, and, you know, he was, he was kind of a likable guy. And remember, after Arkansas, Ivan and Amy went to Tawny's apartment. You know, and this whole time, okay, he's got the gun on him, he's holding this gun on her, she's been to, with her parents for three days? Seriously? Are you cr I'm sorry, just, that just doesn't add up at all for me. Well, at any time did Amy act scared of Ivan? No. She, more, she acted more scared of me. I also asked Tawny about dropping off Amy at the airport. And then for her right. to tell me, check your apartment to make sure that Ivan didn't leave anything. Now, why would she say that? Because she left it there. I know that Ivan did not leave the weapon at my house. He didn't have an opportunity to do that. She did. She was there all day by herself in my apartment. So how would that get, how would that possibly get in my apartment? Her? Is there anything else that suggests evidence was planted? Yes, there is. Something else significant happened on November 4th, the day the bodies were found. Ivan's mom, Sylvia, went over to James and Amy Kitchen's house when she heard the news. Since James was murdered, she was worried about the safety of Ivan and she couldn't get a hold of Ivan because Ivan was out in the country in Arkansas with shoddy cell phone service. Ivan's mom asked two of the officers at the crime scene to go do a wellness check on Ivan's apartment 
to make sure that he wasn't in there, that something bad didn't happen to him. And they didn't report anything out of the ordinary. But remember, the jeans, socks, and gloves were visible in the trash can during the search of Ivan's apartment on November 7th. So if Ivan had left them in there on November 3rd, the night of the murders, they should have been visible on November 4th during this wellness check. During my investigation, I called one of the officers that performed that wellness check. Before we started talking, had you ever seen the pictures of the trash can? I had not. I, that was subsequent to us, uh, you contacting me. And so what did you think initially when I sent you those pictures of the trash can? Well, I thought it was kind of odd because I had been in there prior to those pictures being taken and I didn't see anything of the sort. So when you were in there with you, Younger, and Sylvia, the trash can did not look like that. It did not look like that. Well, so, and does that mean to you that if that wasn't in the trash can at that point and Ivan was out of town, it would be your assessment that someone else other than Ivan or Amy had to put those items in the trash can? That's my assessment, yes. If you look at that stuff, it's just like it screams somebody else came in there and did it. And let's talk about the jeans and socks in the trash can. Around the time of the murders in 2000, Ivan wore jeans size 30-30. Ivan was 5'7", 140 pounds. Well, the jeans that were found in the trash can and taken into evidence were a size 34-32. That is a big difference from size 30-30. And post-conviction DNA testing on the jeans and socks determined. All these these items, these, the socks and the jeans that supposedly he wore. And there's really nothing, there, there isn't conclusive results that say, yes, I'm definitely sure that Ivan was wearing this. I'm not sure if anybody was wearing them or for any extended period of time. I'm very disturbed by that because it makes me feel like you don't know. So they can't tell you who wore the socks. Wow. That's amazing. I can't tell you who wore the jeans. That's amazing. With all this technology you've got, you couldn't show anything that showed it can to for 100%. There's a lot of holes here. And let's look at something else forensically. The victim's rigor mortis. You'll remember Amy Betcher's story is that Ivan committed the murders around midnight. According to the medical examiner's report, when the bodies were found later in the day on November 4th, rigor mortis had not fully set in in Amy's body. I interviewed two forensic pathologists about that, and they both said, It seems like much after, hours after the reported, pos you know, what was that, the 11.30 to 12.15 window, that seemed a lot less likely based on postmortem changes. So Ivan said that he saw Amy alive at 6.30 a.m. that morning. Mm -hmm. So about 12 hours, right, uh -huh. right at 12 hours, prior to this report being taken. Is that possible based on this yes. report? Yes. Is this um, report consistent with James still being alive potentially yes. at 630? 630 to 6, yeah. Is it possible Amy Kitchen was murdered at midnight? I don't think it is. If Ivan said he said last hour alive at 6 o'clock that morning, I would buy it. I'm not buying that they were dead the night before You're at 10 p.m. That. No, not with the Riger setting it in the jaw. She should be in full Riger if she died the night before. So it's more or closer to a time frame that would fit the statement that was made by uh, Mr. Perez. Uh, Mr. Yes, Frank yes. Perez, he said they weren't killed last night, they were killed today. And this is another twist in the story. James and Amy had a mysterious man living with them, staying in their guest bedroom during the time of the murders. Mysterious because none of their other friends or family knew this guy was living there. A man by the name of Frank Perez started staying with James and Amy just a few weeks before the murders and just happened to be out of town the night of the murders. And the same day the bodies were found, after the bodies were removed from the house, the house was opened back up. And a witness in the house noticed that Mr. Perez was acting very strange and suspicious and was using his sweater to open a door and turn on the lights, as if he didn't want to leave any fingerprints on anything. Additionally, the witness heard Mr. Perez say, quote, they weren't killed last night, they were killed today, unquote. 
And that does line up with Amy Kitchen's rigor mortis. So how did Frank know that? We don't know. He wouldn't talk to me, and he was actually one of the only people who refused to talk to me during this investigation. And Ivan's trial attorneys didn't ask Frank Perez when he was on the witness stand. And there's two reasons for that. The first being those reports that were just put on the screen. Even Amy's statements were not handed over to Ivan's defense during the trial. There was actually two three-ring binders consisting of about 400 pages of evidence that was not turned over. Ivan's current lawyer didn't get access to those 400 plus pages until 2012, so 11 years after the trial. And the second reason Ivan's trial attorneys didn't properly question Frank Perez when he was on the witness stand is because Ivan's trial attorneys rendered ineffective assistance of counsel. Here, Ivan's current lawyer argues this point in a 2010 hearing. Counsel really failed to conduct any independent investigation of the facts of this case, apart from what he was given by the state through discovery. James Mosqueda, the victim in this case, was a big-time drug dealer. I mean, the, the evidence clearly shows that. This is another crucial plot point. James was not your average citizen. He was in a business that can get you killed. Uh, he had connections with many big-time drug dealers. Uh, Ivan Cantu was not a drug dealer. He was not involved in that lifestyle. He, was, he used drugs, but he was not involved in the business. Counsel did not request a defense investigator. In a case where the cast of characters alone, uh, Carlos Gonzalez, Anthony Vonseca, Mario Rojas, a, a rival drug dealer who, in the course of the trial, the lead detective for the first time presented to the defense evidence that they had actually received an anonymous tip during the investigation that uh, James Mosqueda owed him a great deal of money. There was a lot of evidence available about the the drug dealers and the, the people that James Mosqueda uh, associated with. The state used, in this case, a DNA expert, a ballistics expert, a blood spatter expert, medical examiner, fingerprint expert. The defense requested not a single expert, not a single expert to attempt to combat the state's case in chief. And not only did the defense not bring on and call their own expert witnesses, the defense did not call any witnesses during the guilt and innocence phase of Ivan's trial. Zero witnesses. On trial for his life, Ivan's attorneys did not put up any defense. And Amy Better, the state's star witness in this case, who, who was Ivan's girlfriend, uh, so much, of course, the state relied on Amy Betcher to make their case. It was indicated at some point she was going to take a polygraph, but she never did. And interestingly, in the, in the trial record, her stepfather recalled her saying, I'm scared to death. After, after she found out that Ivan had been arrested, she says, I'm scared to death. They are going to kill me. Get me out of here. Who is she talking about? And given the evidence that someone else had access to Ivan's apartment, uh, given the evidence that someone else could have driven the Corvette, and Amy Betcher knew these people as well as Ivan did. Ivan is scheduled to be executed on April 26th of this year. And in this case, You've got perjury by the state star witness. You've got the police feeding their witness details to match the crime. You've got the prosecutors feeding their witnesses details to match the crime. Did the prosecution at all talk to you prior to being on the stand? I remember being in like a little room that was connected to the courtroom, but I know for a fact that somebody told me what he was wearing before I went on the stand. Before you told them? Before I told them, yes. I know for a fact they did. You've got withheld evidence and ineffective assistance of counsel. This is all documented. It's horrifying that someone can be put to death when there are all these problems with their conviction. So I ask you, if Ivan is executed on April 26th, is that justice? There's still time to stop it.